It is 1030 on the dot right here in beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. We are coming to you live from the worship center at First Baptist Church where Dr. Charles Stanley is our senior pastor. We welcome those of you who are among our church family as members, but we're just as glad to welcome those of you who are watching who would normally attend other churches or who would attend no church at all. This is a time when we're all tempted to feel like we're alone and by ourselves and completely cut off from others. But one of the prayers we've prayed during these live stream services is that every person who feels that way would, at least during the live stream, feel that you're connected, not only to God, but that you're connected to thousands of other people who are watching at the same time you're watching. Because you see, we're in this together. This morning, it is our privilege to welcome one of the finest families in gospel music to the platform at First Baptist Atlanta, the Collingsworth family. They loaded their bus from where they live near Cincinnati, Ohio, and they traveled down here to lead us in worship and to share some meaningful songs that will draw us into God's presence. And then they'll come back and do some of their standalone songs that will bless you. I hope you enjoy them. For those of you who, ha who have heard them before, you know what you're in store for. And for those of you who have never heard the Collingsworth family, you will never forget them after hearing them today. I hope you'll enjoy this worship experience with us together. Thank you. 
good Sunday morning to you, First Baptist Atlanta. What a unique opportunity for the Collinsworth family to get, get to be back with you one more time. And this beautiful Lord's Day morning, we don't want you to just be a neutral observer. We want you to be a participator. They put the lyrics there on the screens for you, and we want you to join with us, and let's lift up the beautiful, wonderful name of Jesus. Sing with us. Jesus, we crown you with praise. Promises us that if we'll lift him up, men will be drawn to him. Keith and Kristen Getty are some of the finest modern hymn writers, and some of their songs have become very well known, and even published in some hymnals. Here's one that I think most of you will know. I love these words in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. And righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I. Oh, 
in this very unique setting on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is a privilege for the Collinsworth family to get to be back with our friends again in an unusual format at First Baptist Atlanta. We always love coming here. And uh, Pastor Anthony came and said, he has a song he wanted us to sing this morning. And we uh, surprisingly haven't sung this for about five or six years. And so um, we put it together quickly. I don't know, it's been a while, but boy, do we love singing this. Let's, let's try it, Kim. We stand here together As a family we join hands together Lifting praises to the Father above For sending His Son We've chosen together as a family to serve him forever knowing nothing else will matter in time we've made up our minds through the heat of the day we will join in the fight till he takes us away What a blessing. Phil, Kim, thank you for sharing your beautiful family with us. Of all the groups we could have, there's not a group we would rather have more than the Collingsworth family. And they're going to return in just a few moments and bless us yet again. I would like to join uh, Dr. George in welcoming you to our live stream service today. You know, back in March on the 22nd, we launched our live stream service with Vimeo platform. But unfortunately, many of our viewers experienced uh, problems with that platform. And so last week, we uh, began streaming on YouTube, and the response has been absolutely wonderful. So we're so delighted that you're having a much better experience on that platform. This morning, we are yet expanding our viewing options with Facebook Live, and we hope that you're going to be successful and be encouraged by God's Word through this new platform of streaming. You know, you may be interested to know that our analytics are showing that we now have viewers in all 50 states and in more than 50 countries around the world. And we thank God for what he is doing through this live stream technology. Additionally, we are hearing reports from churches and pastors across the country who are having great success through live streaming. As a matter of fact, 
our experts are telling us right now, those who follow the data, that churches have increased in viewing attendance by 40%. Now you think about that, a 40% increase in viewership. Most of our campuses could not even accommodate an increase in attendance, but we are thankful for what God is doing through this technology. You know, this is the thing that is so amazing to us, that when our physical doors are closed in our churches, God is still growing his church. And we are delighted and thankful for the opportunity that we have to share the gospel, not only through the United States, but around the world using this technology. I know that you have been blessed just by your emails and text messages and phone calls, and we hope that you will continue being blessed. I would like to just lead us in a word of of prayer as we'll thank the Lord for what all he is doing. And then the Collingsworth family will return and they will bless us again as we prepare our hearts for the word of God. And then Dr. George will come and lead us in our scripture study today. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we are so thankful when we hear these reports, not only around the country, but around the globe. And those who are viewing maybe for the first time and being exposed to the gospel. Lord, we thank you for the lives that are being changed. And Lord, while these numbers are all impressive, they represent more than numbers. They represent lives and changed lives because they are hearing the gospel presentation. Lord, for that, we are absolutely amazed and thankful and blessed and humbled all at the same time. So Father, our prayer is a church. And I know that I join many pastors around the country when we say, Lord, thank you for giving us the increase. Lord, thank you for the use of this technology. Lord, that we're able to continue preaching the gospel, sharing the word, and leading in worship. Father, today I want to lift our pastor, Dr. Stanley, to you. Lord, I want you to, Lord, continue giving him strength and health in these days ahead. Lord, I pray for our messenger today, Dr. George, as he comes and lead us in the word that you have placed upon his heart. Lord, thank you for sending the precious Collingsworth family to lead us in our worship today and to prepare our hearts for, for the word of God. Thank you for the many viewers who are joining us today. Father, I just pray now for those who are on the front line, our healthcare workers, our doctors, our nurses, those, Lord, who are out there providing care for so many who are sick, who are ill with this virus. Father, we pray for complete restoration and healing as only you can provide. Lord, we pray for protection for those around the world, Lord, that they will not, uh, that they will not be infected by this virus, but Lord, that you would hedge us in. Lord, we look forward to the day that we will be able to rejoin together in one place as we rejoice and we sing and we praise you in your holy name. Now, Father, we give this service over to you to do as you will, and we give you the glory for what you're about to do in the holy, precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
Standing at the crossroads of faith and deepest fear So afraid of failing if you move on from here The road ahead is steep but you're not giving up Cause God's about to take you to a brand new place of trust. Take a step of faith, it's time to move. Lay aside your fears and watch what God will do. There's victory ahead, that mountain's not too high, friend. Hold on, cause you're about to climb Higher heights await you beyond what you can dream And they're yours for the taking if you dare to believe So leave your doubts behind and let God make you brave Cause he has gone before you He's already made the way Take a step of faith It's time to move Lay aside your fears And watch what God will do There's victory ahead But mountains not too high Take you to the 
I tell you what, we just need to let that soak in for a little bit. That was absolutely amazing. What a glorious gift she has. And I don't know if you feel it where you are, but when she sits on the piano and I'm anywhere nearby, there is an anointing from God that falls upon her, and it is something to behold. When you think about the great men and women that God has used throughout the years, preachers and those who have done great things for God, missionaries, people who have founded great companies and have used their company as a witness for their testimony. We could go on and on with examples of these kinds of people from biblical days to the times in which you and I live. Very few of those that God has used brought exceptional talent to the table. Very few people that God has used have brought a lot of resources with them when they bowed before God and said, take my life and, and use me. But what they have come to find is what so many people have come to find is that it doesn't take someone with exceptional talents and gifts and abilities, and it doesn't take people with a lot of resources and wealth and notoriety. No, God says, just give me the little bit that you have and watch what I can do with it. And the title of today's message is simply, Little is Much. Little is Much. And I'd like for you, if you have your Bibles, to open them to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. And we're going to read together, uh, beginning in verse 31, a story that is very familiar to most of you who are listening to me today. It's the story that we refer to as the feeding of the 5,000. And in Mark chapter 6 and verse 31, the Bible tells us that following a time of intense ministry, a demanding and rigorous schedule, Jesus said it's time for a little R&R. &R. He says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. <clears throat> so they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. 
We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. So they came back and reported, well, we've got five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to get the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100, and Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. <laughs> Verse 42 says, And so everyone ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. And Mark tells us a total of 5,000 men and their families and their families were fed. Now, this is one of the most memorable miracles that Jesus ever performed. Simply put, it was remarkable to take a little bit and turn it into too much. But I'll tell you another reason why this miracle stands out above all the rest that Jesus did is because this miracle alone is the only miracle that is recorded in all four of what we call the gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you think of all the things Jesus did, this is the only miracle that all four of those writers included in their account about the life and works of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a very special miracle. And what I want to do is just in a few moments that we have together is I want to lift from this passage some very simple, some very basic principles about Jesus and his relationship with us that both young and old can write down and comprehend because they're so basic and simple, and yet they're so foundational to what we need to know about him and what he desires to do in our lives. So here's the first thing that I want you to write down. Get something to write with if you don't have it already. And I want you to write this down. Jesus sees our spiritual needs. He sees our spiritual needs. I love this passage because it shows how much Jesus cares about people. And you can uh, read the verses just before it where Jesus said to his disciples, we need some time to get away. You guys have been working awfully hard and we need to just sequester somewhere and have some isolation time, some downtime. And I love that about Jesus that he gives us permission to have some downtime when we need it. The only problem is once they got to where they were going, the crowds had anticipated their arrival and the word had gotten out that the miracle worker, this man who is the Messiah, he is, he's on the other side and people started emptying out of their towns and villages and so much for a break, so much for vacation time or a little retreat. Here are the crowds and here's what Jesus could have done. He, said, he could have said, you know, I came over here to get away from everybody. I don't need all of this. Guys, we needed some, uh, some break time. You know, it's impossible to get away from people. There's always somebody pulling at you, telling you, we want to hear some more. We need you to do this for us or do that for us. That is not how Jesus responded. Jesus responded with love. And the Bible tells us, we read it in verse 34, it says that he looked upon them with compassion. He wasn't frustrated with them. He wasn't put off by their showing up to where he had hoped to have a little rest time with his disciples. Oh, no. He looked upon them with compassion and love and tenderness and mercy because that's who Jesus is. I'm glad he's like that. He cares about people. And you know what? He, he cares about, first and foremost, people's spiritual needs. Because the Bible tells us that he began in verse number 34, it says he began teaching them. Imagine that. A crowd is there and he starts teaching. So far, no miracles are introduced. So far, nobody's worried about food yet. Nobody's talking about being hungry. Nobody's waiting for some supernatural manifestation because Jesus said the first thing, the most important thing is, I want to tell them about God's word. I want to give them what the Bible calls the good news of the kingdom of God. And so he was teaching them. And when we read it, you know how long the sermon lasted? It lasted all day. Oh yeah, it lasted all day. 
And some of you thought you've sat through some long ones. Imagine sitting through an all-day sermon. I heard a definition of a good sermon is it has a good beginning and a good ending, and those two should be as close together as possible. <laughs> now, if that's the definition of a good sermon, I don't think I've preached a good one yet because those two are, are, are too far apart in most sermons that I preach. Uh, they, they tell us over at In Touch that they've, they've studied the average watch time of their viewers on the TV broadcast, and, and, and it's right about 18 minutes, 18 minutes. And uh, I've had to keep that in mind when I think about this live stream. I sure hope your attention span is longer than 18 minutes because we're trying to pack this hour so full of worship and, and meaningful music and valuable teaching. I hope you're able to sit there and focus because uh, G what Jesus understands is our greatest need is not physical. Our greatest need is spiritual. And what I want all of us to understand is that every miracle Jesus ever performed, he performed to meet a physical need in order to build a bridge to a spiritual need. Every miracle Jesus ever performed was not simply to do a quick fix for somebody who needed a meal, someone who was sick who needed to be healed. Every miracle he performed was to draw people to believe in him as the son of the living God because he knew that's what it takes to be saved. You must call upon Jesus to be saved. And so it's a good reminder to us today to, to, to recognize that, that while physical needs are important, Jesus models for us the real priority. He spent all day teaching because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd, and he knew that they needed him to be their shepherd. And I don't care who you are, where you live, from where you're viewing today, that's your greatest need. Your greatest need is not to know how the future is going to unwind or uh, that you're going to have plenty of money in the bank when all of this is over, or that you'll still have a job. Your greatest need is to be connected to the God who made you. Your greatest need is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Your greatest need is to have a purpose for living in this life. Your greatest need is to know that when this life is over, you'll go on to live the next life in heaven for eternity. Jesus sees our spiritual needs. Now, having said that, I want you to write this down. He also sees our physical needs. And while our physical needs are not as important as our spiritual needs, our physical needs are important nonetheless. The, the Bible tells us in verse number 37, after the disciples came and, and said, what are we going to do to feed all these people? It's getting late and they've been here all day and they've got to be hungry. And Jesus said, you feed them. You feed them. And what did Jesus go on to do? He went on to perform a miracle to feed all of them. I love reading this because the disciples, some have suggested that they really weren't interested in feeding all these people. They were hungry themselves and they were just trying to give Jesus a hint. It's time to land the plane, Jesus. It's time to wrap this sermon up. It's supper time and these people are hungry. Well, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and think they really did care about how to feed these people. And when they were looking at all the people, and by the way, 5,000 are just the men in the crowd. Some scholars have suggested if the wives and kids were along, this could have been between 10,000 and upwards of 20,000 people out in this big field for this all-day preaching with Jesus Christ. Now, can you imagine what those disciples thought when Jesus said, you feed them? They thought, we don't have enough money to feed them. In fact, some translations say it would take 200 denarii, and really what that is the equivalent of for an average laborer in, in that day and time, about eight months of salary. And they were saying, uh, we don't have this kind of money, and even if we could, every person would only get a little, little morsel to eat. And can you imagine what kind of restaurant they'd have to go find? It's very clear they're out in the middle of nowhere. Can you imagine a restaurant taking a, an order for takeout for 5000 <laughs> That's some kind of catering gig right there. But there was no restaurant anywhere near that could accommodate such an overwhelming order. And that's what Jesus was doing here. He was pointing out that they needed him to do something. But let's get back to the point. Jesus cares about physical needs. You know what Jesus ended up doing? He ended up feeding all of these people because he knew that food is important. 
In fact, many of you who grew up in church, you remember learning the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You remember the next part? Give us this day our, our daily bread. Do you know what Jesus was teaching us to pray to the Father? He was teaching us to pray to the Father, Father, please give us daily bread. What is daily bread? It's food. It's what we have to have. And even in the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus pointed out is that God cares about us having food to eat. God cares about meeting our needs. In Matthew chapter 6, in that same Sermon on the Mount where the Lord's Prayer is found, he said, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink, enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And he says in verse 26, look at the birds. They don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't store food up in big barns like we do. But, but Jesus says, your heavenly Father still feeds them. And he says, aren't you far more valuable to God than the birds that God takes care of. <laughs> when I was reading this, getting ready for this sermon, I, it was just very vivid to me because just outside my front door, I've got these, these pretty ferns in these planters. And I've been noticing when I would sit in the morning in the chair that looks out my front window, a little wren who's been flying back and forth to that fern. And I finally decided to lift up some of the leaves of the fern and I notice where she has hollowed out and made a little nest right there in the shelter of this fern at my front door. And the other night I was out there and I lifted it up with a flashlight and I saw her hunkered down on what I have now discovered is about three eggs that she's incubating. <laughs> and it just warmed my heart because I thought, there she is, watching over her soon-to-be young, young baby birds and God himself is taking care of that little bird. And like Jesus said, if God takes care of the birds, don't we think that we're more valuable to God than birds? And I want you to know if there's any doubt in your mind, yes, you are. And yes, I am. And if he takes care of the birds, he will take care of us. Jesus wants us to understand that God cares about our physical needs. And food is a big part of it. Can I get an amen on that? We all love to have good food. But God is interested in, in, in our clothing. God is interested in us having a place to live. God is interested in meeting our physical needs because that's one more way he can demonstrate his love and his watch care over us. So you see, Jesus sees our spiritual needs. He sees our physical needs. But, but I want you to write this down. Jesus wants to meet all of our needs. He not only sees our needs, he wants to meet our needs. He wants to meet our spiritual needs and our physical needs alike. In addition to Jesus being our Savior, which happens when we ask him to, to save our souls, Jesus wants to be our source. Would you just say that word with me? Source. Source means the, the one from whom we draw what we need in life. The one on whom we rely to sustain us, to uphold us, to provide for us. When I look at this story, it's easy to just kind of say, oh, wow, Jesus was sending a big message to these 5,000 men and all of their families that he was going to feed. But, but if you look a lot closer, you see Jesus was teaching his disciples just as much as he was teaching the crowd. Jesus was, was teaching his disciples a faith lesson. And uh, if you're like me, you realize that, that Jesus is always doing this. <laughs> Just when you think you know things are going well and you don't really have any needs, the Lord will allow something to come up in our lives because he's, he's ready to teach us our next step of faith, the next dimension, the next realm of our relationship with him, of our trust and our belief in him. I love it when the disciples said, what are we going to do? It's time to feed these people. They're all hungry and they've sat and listened to you preach all day. And Jesus said, you feed them. You feed them. Why in the world? Did Jesus say you feed them when if Jesus is God in human flesh, and he is, and Jesus already knew how he was going to meet the need with a miracle to feed all of these thousands of people, why would he say you feed them? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted to bring them to an awareness of their inadequacy to feed them. 
of their inability to feed them. They'd have to go find money. They'd have to go find restaurants. (laughs) This was an impossible task. And I think that Jesus wanted them to understand when you're at the end of what you have to offer, when you are out of answers, when you are out of resources, when you are out of what you need to get something done and to take care of a situation, that's when you need God the most. You feed them. They said, we can't feed them. Jesus said, bingo. That's what I was waiting for you to realize. We need Jesus to feed them. We need Jesus to come through. We need Jesus to pull this off. May I tell you something today? Jesus Christ sees our needs as his opportunity. Don't miss that. He sees our needs as his opportunity. He uses life to expose our need and to help us to realize that we need him to provide that need. And when I think about need, uh, you know, I've been thinking about our gyms that, that are slowly reopening. I've been, I've been missing going to the gym. And um, when, you're, when you're on quarantine, I don't know what your experience is, but I've been eating a lot. I've been snacking a lot. I can't wait to go back to the gym and try to burn some of this off. But here's what I want you to understand something. Our need is like the gym where faith works out. If, if, if you're not in need, faith doesn't have an opportunity to build its muscle. Need is the place where faith works out and gets stronger. I'll tell you something else about need. Need is the stage where Jesus does his best performance. <laughs> My need is the platform on which Jesus stands to show me who he is and those watching him take care of me who he is. Need requires provision, (laughs) and provision requires a provider to give the provision. And so simply put, need is what God uses as an invitation for us to come to him. I can tell you this, that so many of you watching me today who know Jesus Christ, you would not have been saved if God had not used a time of need in your life to break you, to put you on your knees, to flatten you so that the only direction you had was to look up. Need is an invitation call from God. Turn to me. Trust me. I got this. I'll take care of you. So many people look at this story and say that Jesus started with a little boy's lunch. But you know what? Before the little boy's lunch was found, which we read about in the sixth chapter of John, the disciples were just (laughs) empty-handed. Sometimes, you see, Jesus doesn't even start with a little bit in our hands. Sometimes Jesus starts with nothing in our hands. I'm glad to know that, that whether I have a little bit to give to him and ask him to bless it, or even if I come to him empty-handed, he, he needs nothing. Jesus can, can, turn, can, can turn nothing into something, and Jesus can turn a little bit into a lot. It does not matter what you bring to him. Watch him bless it. Watch him work. Now, Jesus didn't have to use this little boy's lunch, but I'm glad he did. <laughs> I'm so glad he did. Can you imagine, I don't know how old this kid was, but he had this little basket of these uh, five barley cakes. Now, please understand, these aren't big loaves of Wonder Bread here. We're talking about little flat barley wafers. So it's the type of thing that one person, even a young kid, could easily consume at a sitting. Two small fish and five little cakes of of barley, five little loaves of bread, as as the scriptures say. I want to ask you a question. After that day, when that kid saw Jesus keep stretching his lunch and feeding all of these people, maybe between 10 and 20,000 were fed just with his lunch, what do you think this kid talked about for the rest of his life? (laughs) Hey, can I tell you about the time when I was out there in this field with this man named Jesus, and I saw him take my lunch and feed thousands of people with it. I'm telling you, this guy was still talking about this when he and his wife one day had children. And then when they had children, this guy was still telling his grandchildren about it. What I love about this is Jesus loves helping write chapters in our story. And some of you 
are just like that little boy who gave Jesus and the disciples his lunch, and you have watched him multiply it time and time again, and it has become part of your story. You enjoy telling it, telling about it. Can I, you've told children, you've told grandchildren, can I tell you about a time when I had nothing and God got me through? Or I didn't have enough, but somehow God stretched it out. Jesus loves to help us write our faith story. And I love hearing your stories. That's one of the reasons why we love hearing from you during this time of live stream. I've, I've often heard Dr. Stanley talk about this story. And Dr. Stanley can't help but think about the fact that there was probably a mama back at home somewhere who had packed that boy's little basket of lunch. And imagine the story that he had to tell his mama when he got back home that night. Mom, you'll never guess what that man named Jesus did with the lunch you packed for me. Well, what, what I want you to see in this is that Jesus can take whatever we have and he can multiply it. Now, when you look at the disciples who've been told to feed the people, Jesus said, you feed them. They're thinking about how much it would cost, where we could find a restaurant. They're looking for solutions. Can I tell you what Jesus is looking for? Jesus isn't looking for solutions. He knows the solution. You ready for this? Jesus is looking for faith. Oh, that's right. He's not looking for us to solve things. He's looking for us to trust him to give us the solution. Everywhere Jesus went, he looked for faith above everything else. Uh, in the instance of uh, the Roman centurion, some of you may remember the story where this Gentile, this Roman military officer had a servant whom he loved very much who needed intervention for, for a miracle with the servant's health. And the Roman centurion said some things about his understanding of Jesus' relationship to God. And in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10, it says, When Jesus heard what that centurion said, he was amazed. And he turned to those following him, and he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. What did he say? I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And then there's a story about these two blind men who were following Jesus, saying, Jesus, son of David, please heal us and have mercy on us. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 28, 29, it says, when Jesus had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe I'm able to do this, to heal you? And they said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, look at what Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith, let it be to you. The miracle will come according to the faith that you have. And then just in the same chapter we're studying today in Mark chapter 6, the Bible tells us that Jesus had gone to his uh, hometown of Nazareth. And in verse 5 it says, Because of their unbelief, he could not do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed by their unbelief. You know what unbelief is? Unbelief is a lack of faith. <laughs> that verse in the sixth chapter of Mark in verse 5 blows my mind. It says, because they didn't have faith, he was unable to perform many miracles. And then in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8, Jesus asked this question. He says, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have what? Who have faith? Jesus is looking for faith. So my question to you is, as Jesus looks down on us from heaven during a time of crisis, during a time when our future looks so uncertain, during a time when we have no idea what life will look like a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, there's one thing he's looking for. Jesus is looking for faith. And what I want to invite you to do this morning is to give God what you have and ask him to bless it. To do just what this little boy did. To take what he had because you can't give God what you don't have. He gave God what he had and he watched the son of the living God multiply his lunch basket to take care of so many people. Because 
to God, our faith is a gift. Our faith pleases God. Oh, it puts a big smile on his face when he looks down and sees us looking up, saying, I trust you, Lord. It, it not only pleases God, but our faith moves God. I, I, do you hear what I'm telling you? It moves him to action. And I want to tell you something else about our faith. I hope no one misunderstands this, but our faith obligates God. I don't mean that, that we obligate God. Listen to me when I say this. God obligates himself because when we trust a promise that God has made, by God's very character, if he has promised us something and we've believed it by faith, if God is true to what he has promised, he's obligated to respond to our faith. There was a man named Balaam in the Old Testament who declared the glory of God. And in Numbers 23, 19, look at what he said about God. God is not a man, therefore God does not lie. He's not human, so he doesn't change his mind. Has God ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? And the answer is no, he has not. Everything he said, he will do. Everything he's promised, he will carry through. God cannot lie. That's why he wants to be believed. And I love what Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 says. It says, it is impossible for God to lie. Can you say impossible? Say impossible. <laughs> Somebody said, there is nothing impossible for God. I can tell you, that's one thing that is impossible for God. God cannot lie. And then, what is, what is one such promise about which he will not lie and which he will not fail to deliver? A promise you and I can stand on. Philippians 4.19. It says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so you know what? You take that promise and you turn to Philippians 4.19 and you say, Heavenly Father, I come to you as your trusting child. You've promised me in your word that you would supply all of my needs, that you would take care of me, that you would meet my needs, that you would be my source. You promised, Lord, I'm believing that you will make good on this promise. I trust you with childlike faith. When God hears that, I'm telling you God moves into action. I believe it with all of my heart. That's why I'm a preacher. <laughs> I, wouldn't be the, I wouldn't be a preacher. I wouldn't be spending my life preaching this book if I thought that God would let people down and fail to deliver on his promise. But you see, I know God is good and God is faithful and you can count on him. You see, you need to look at what you have and give it to God. You say, well, I don't have, I don't have a lot of groceries. Well, do you have faith? Then watch God work. I don't have much money. Do you have faith? Then watch God work. I don't know how my job looks right now. Things look mighty uncertain. Do you have faith? Then watch God work. Well, I, I think I'm going to lose my insurance for me and my family. Do you have faith? Watch God work. Well, I'm afraid I might lose my home. Do you have faith? Then watch God work. You give him what you have and you ask him to bless it. And <laughs> How many times have you been in a situation where what you needed was more than you had? You know what you call that? That's when you have less. And some of you need to come to God and say, God, what I need is more than I have, so I want you to take my less and please bless. <laughs> will he do it? He will bless your less. Yes, he will. And then some of you are saying, well, pastor, I, all I have is distress. Then give it to God. <laughs> Say, God, this stuff is taking a toll on my mind. I, I, I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I don't know what's going to happen in my future. All I have is distress. You know what God says? I'll bless your distress. Give it to me. And then if you're like me, <laughs> many times you've just looked at your life and it's nothing but a big fat mess. And how many times have I looked up to God and said, God, all I've got is a mess. Please bless my mess. <laughs> Would you pray that prayer? Lord, please bless my mess. And time and time again, he'll bless your mess. <laughs> he'll take what you've got 
and bless it like he did the loaves and the fishes. You see, here's the thing God wants you to know. Miracles don't make sense. If they made sense, they wouldn't be miracles. This makes no sense. There, there's no explanation. This doesn't say anybody saw the, the bread growing or the bread multiplying or the fish expanding. It just says Jesus, kept, Jesus blessed it in prayer, broke it, and everybody ate and was filled, and they had 12 baskets left over. It doesn't say how this happened. Does it make sense that a little boy's lunch could feed up to 20,000 people? It makes no sense, but that's why it's a miracle. But it all started in prayer in verse 41, where Jesus took the loaves and the two fish, and he looked up toward heaven, and he blessed them. He blessed them. He said, Father, please bless this little boy's lunch. How many times through my years of life have I had my back against the wall and I've prayed this prayer. I, I've prayed it literally, Lord, I need a loaves and fishes miracle. <laughs> I need a loaves and fishes miracle. That's been a prayer of mine many, many times. I remember as a teenager, 12th grade working at Winn-Dixie, bagging groceries. I had very little money to ever call my own. My family didn't have a lot of money. I was sitting in a youth service in First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. We were over in this old auditorium. Imagine this because the main auditorium was too full for the students to be in it on a Sunday night. <laughs> and they passed the offering plate for the teenagers. And I had a $10 bill in my pocket. And that's the only money I would have until the next payday. And something told me, put it in. I'm sitting there wrestling with, with, with God like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm 17 years old. I'm bagging groceries at the grocery store. All I have is this $10 bill. I put the $10 bill in the offering plate. And the next day, when I got home from school, my grandmother in Mississippi, Betty Jane Black, she had sent me a card with a $20 bill in the card. <laughs> now, here's the thing. God knew she had already put that in the mail. And what God taught me as a 17-year-old kid is that when he prompts you to give him what you've got, even when it's all you've got, he'll take it. And in my case, he doubled my money. Does he always do that? No, but I'll tell you what he did do. He taught me that when you give him a little, he'll turn it into a lot if you only trust him. I'll never forget that. Obviously, I'm 50 years old and I'm still talking about it because it taught me that little is much when Jesus blesses it. Well, I, I want to wrap this up today, but I've got to tell you something. I knew about 10 days ago I needed to preach on this because I knew somebody needed to hear the loaves and the fishes story from the Bible. And it's not just a story. I believe it's true. It really happened. And so I was praying last week and I said, Lord, show me something new in this passage. I mean, maybe there's, maybe I've seen everything there is to see, but show me something fresh. I pray that a lot when I study the Bible. And I hope nobody thinks that I'm getting all mystical and that I'm seeing things in the Bible that aren't there. But I'm going to tell you something. Yesterday afternoon when I was studying this, God showed me something that put me on the floor and caused me to, as we say, have church right here at the church in my library, finishing up this message. And I want to tell you what I've seen. I've seen what I call prophetic math. You ready for it? You don't even need a calculator for this one. Prophetic math. Because I was looking at the numbers in this and how many loaves were there in that little boy's lunch? There were five of them. How many fishes were in that little boy's lunch basket? There were two of them. Five plus two is seven. And the Bible tells us that there were how many baskets of leftovers that were taken up after the thousands were fed? There were 12. And when you add five plus two plus 12, you get a grand total of 19. You say, what in the world are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. When I saw that, and I added up those numbers. Do you know the name that the scientists have given to this particular coronavirus that has brought so much destruction across our world? It is COVID-19. And the prophetic math of this passage adds up to 19, just like our COVID-19. And you know what I hear God saying to us? You think your 19 is a threat? Watch what my 19 will do to that 19. You see, COVID-19 doesn't stand a chance in the life of a child of God who takes what he has, who takes what she has, either nothing or even a little, 
and you give it to God and you watch God work. I want to ask you, do you trust God to take what you have and to be your provider no matter what COVID-19 brings our way? <laughs> do you trust God's 19 to win the war with COVID-19? I do. And I don't know if that blessed you like it did me, but from now on until this virus goes away, and I pray it will, every time I hear COVID-19, I'm going to think about five loaves, two fishes, 12 baskets of leftovers, and I'm choosing to believe in the power of God's 19 over COVID-19. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing us to worship together today. Thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you for meeting our spiritual needs through salvation. And thank you for caring about our physical needs and for responding when we trust you by faith. May everyone who's heard this message be strengthened in their own walk with you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
Oh, how thankful we are to have had the Collingsworth family with us. That's what the Bible says, and you can't improve on that message whatsoever. I hope that you've been blessed today. And for those of you who've joined in for the very first time, if you'd care enough to send us your feedback or your comments or any prayer concerns, you can drop us a note to online at fba.org. That's been our primary way of hearing from those who've been watching each week. And we encourage you to take the time to send us your thoughts. And those of you who are still taking some selfies and some family pics or anything you think would be a blessing to us, we're still working on presentations to roll into our live stream in the future. Send us some pics. We love it when we can see you and celebrate you. We really do appreciate that. I also want to say to those who are members of our church, of course, this doesn't apply to those who are watching as our guests, but to our members, thank you, thank you for giving. And for those of you who've not yet given online but would like to, you simply go to our website and you click on the giving tab up at the top. But we've introduced some other ways to give, especially a new method for te texting to give, which you can see on your screen right now. I also want to mention to you that in addition to our our uh, texting to give, this is even more important than that, which is if you are watching today and you would like to pray the prayer of salvation, the prayer of faith that invites Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you can do that right now. But we have some of our pastors who are on standby who would love to follow up with you. And we have other staff members as well who'd like to do this. And we're asking you to simply text the word Jesus to the number that you see on the screen. Just text the word Jesus. And when you text that word Jesus, because he's the one we want you to know, he's the one we want you to believe in and trust with all of your hearts, he is is the one who cares about your spiritual needs, your physical needs, who wants to be your provider. We will call you later this afternoon. We'll follow up with you by text. We'll communicate with you according to your preference. We just want to help you. Maybe you have recently come to faith in Christ and you're wondering what your next steps should be. Text Jesus to that same number and some of our team members will follow up with you and encourage you along your spiritual journey and even pass along some valuable resources for you. I hope that you will tune in in the coming weeks as we anticipate we're going to be live streaming for the indefinite future. Until next time, I pray you have a blessed week and I'll see you at 1030 next Sunday morning.